or desire. And that's okay if you've got enough money and so on. Now, what about all our policies, all our development projects? What about all policies in agriculture in Alberta? What is the context? Every one of those policies has an objective. What context? Do you know we never ask that? And the context, 99% of the time, is the problem being addressed. The noxious weed, the floods, whatever it is. In the real world, that's an inadequate context. Now you begin to see why so many of our policies end up in conflicts, unintended consequences. Simple as that. We just didn't have a real world context. So when we look at policies and projects, or the actions of a farmer on the farm or the wherever, they need to be achievable, particularly if they're policies or projects with public support. They should not address symptoms and they should not lead to damaging consequences. Is that happening in Alberta? Frankly, it's not happening anywhere. Even with our fully integrated scientific team. It's not happening. When I put 2,000 USDA scientists through training in the 80s, teaching them how to use the holistic framework to formulate and analyze policies, they brought their own policies to the trainings, a week of training. They analyzed their own policies. They, not me, could not find a single policy that wasn't addressing symptoms and wouldn't lead to unintended consequences. One group in training, and I put it in our textbook, made a statement that we wrote down, it's a unanimous agreement, and they said, we now recognize that unsound resource management is universal in the United States. Do you think it's any different in Canada? The significance of what I'm telling you is so profound, it's mind-boggling. And so simple, as that Brazilian said. All right, so when we look at this, let's look at what we are trying to achieve. I don't think any thinking person would argue today that management needs to be holistic and to embrace the best of our current science. I think we, we would get very wide agreement on that. So how do we do that? What does it mean? And why are we not achieving it with our integrated science teams as we've got? Well, how we do things today is we have an objective. You know, we have these three tools. We cannot use our creativity out and through them. And we always make our decisions on one or more of many factors past results, research results, experience, whatever. Cultural norms, compromise, expediency, friends' advice, whatever. That's how we do things today in our home, in government, in our universities, all walks of life. Now, already from what we've spoken about, you see that we have no option but to add large animals as tools, without which we're not going to survive. Now, we do that, but we've still got a problem. So here we've put in the livestock. Now, we need to manage holistically. Everything we make is a success. This building, the computers, the planes, those are not complex. Those are complicated. Everything we manage, governments, organizations, agriculture, fisheries, climate, finance, economy, everything we manage involves complexity, self-organizing, etc. Okay, so when we look at management, if we take our integrated teams, we're working on the left here, the um, objectives have an inadequate context. So what makes management holistic is when we have an adequate context for our objectives. Now, what could be a context? This was the most difficult thing to discover. It was when we got this piece finally in 1984 
we began to see consistent results across the board. What we didn't know is what the hell we were looking for. There was nothing in any branch of science that said what is there beyond a vision, a mission, a goal, but those are all linear. There was nothing in any religion in the world. There was nothing in any philosophy in the world. So we were looking for a vacuum. We didn't know what the devil it was. And gradually, piece by piece, it fell into place. And we have a holistic context. And then with that, we use a set of filters, simple filters. Remember, you couldn't count the dots. So we use some simple little filters that people can quickly check that their objective is in context. And it will be socially, environmentally, and economically right on that farm, that ranch, that government agency, whatever it is, at that time. Very, very simple to do. So what does managing holistically involve? It involves using that framework on the right, just a modification of what we've done for thousands of years, getting our objectives <coughs> in a holistic context, using all current science and future science and traditional knowledge, going back to what pastorists and others knew and what the knowledge that would in this room would amaze us if we could put together the knowledge in your heads. It would just be mind-boggling. So it's uh, how do we use all of that knowledge and the science and then uh, decide on our actions. And when you do this, you begin to realize there's no such thing as a best management practice. That's an oxymoron. That's like civil service, military intelligence. Okay. Um, why no best management practice? Because every farm is totally unique. Every family, totally unique every year. So you can only have planning process, decision-making process work, and no prescription. So what might be right this year may not be right next year. You've got to be just constantly planning and moving along. Now, at this point on any farm, whatever it is, anything in agriculture, this is where we're deciding, do you run livestock? What kind of livestock? Should livestock not be there? Um, this is where you're deciding the type of crops, the mix of crops, all of this stuff, getting it socially, environmentally, economically sound. Now, if livestock are to be run, then the planning of grazing kicks in. That's why it's called holistic planned grazing. That's why the word. And that's why I said in the TED talk, I didn't have time to talk about it, I said using this we can get it socially, environmentally and economically right by using that. So that's what managing holistically involves. Those two processes and nothing else. Now the <coughs> I'm not the first to realize the difficulty our educational system that I went through had got us into. Okay, the, one of the people that really brought this to the fore was a Canadian, John Ralston Saul. And you should all read his book, Voltaire's Bastards. I've read it about six times. There is so much wisdom packed into that book. And he studied how things had gone wrong from Voltaire's time on as we engaged experts to run management. And people could no longer buy their positions or inherit their positions. And he found things got worse than they had been prior to that. And he made this statement. Now, none of these people are wrong. It was that something systemically wrong, the way we were making decisions and managing. So we can make all of that much more successful now, bring people together, and that's what we're concentrating on. So we at the, our institute are concentrating on agriculture and two things. Reverse the desertification of the world's grasslands and then removing the barriers to using science in management. Because everywhere we go, we find there are barriers. And those barriers are not coming from ordinary people. They're coming from our institutions, 
our organizations, laws, regulations, policies. That's where the barriers are coming from, not from ordinary farmers and, and pastors. And almost all of the knowledge we need is already available. Now, I just want to remind you that although we're talking in Alberta and I'm talking about your agriculture and your critical role in making it important here, we are a global community now. And the most problematic area in the world, the most violence, is right through that area to China, where 95% of that land, approximately, can only feed people from animals, animal products, not from crops. And only animals can address the climate change and the coming water wars that are going to be worse than oil wars. Now, if you don't change on your farms, if you don't change in Alberta, if you don't begin to change Canada, if we don't change public opinion, frankly, you can expect a hell of a lot more military funerals. <coughs> because I'm working in Africa, and for example, in Baluchistan, on the border of uh, Afghanistan, when I was there 30 years ago, warning and what I was seeing, every single professional person I spoke to and dealt with who was producing those policies that are going to lead to war was trained in a North American university. So the problem is flowing from here. And we can only change it with public opinion changing, major change, and all beginning to teamwork together. And all we have to bring to the table is a way of doing it. Not a silver bullet, no the solution, because there will never be one, but a way we can begin to work it out together. And so we are now launching a strategy of establishing locally led, locally managed hubs all around the world. We had people from 12 nations meeting with us about two weeks ago in Boulder, tragically none from Canada, but these were from Turkey, Sweden, Norway, UK, Argentina, Chile, Africa, Australia, and we're forming these locally led managed hubs where people can all begin managing holistically on land, teaching each other rapidly so that we get it to every person in agriculture, and we will be connecting them 